Then, just eight years later, it happened again. Only this time, the dark horse just wasn't up to the job. He was Franklin Pierce. I received the nomination without expecting it. It was brought about by mutual concession. Franklin Pierce spent most of his life in Hillsborough, New Hampshire, where he began his career as a young New England lawyer who went on to be elected to Congress. In Washington, he became known less for his politics than for his socializing. He had a magnetic personality and memorable good looks. And as a heavy drinker, he was always ready for a rowdy night on the town. I have been leading, I need not say, a very agreeable life. In 1834, after two years as a Washington bachelor, Pierce married Jane Means Appleton, an introverted minister's daughter who was intensely shy and often ill. Jane's health has prevented her from mingling as much in gay society as we might otherwise have done. Jane hated Washington, hated politics, and hated most of all her husband's drinking. When Pierce refused to change his ways, his sickly wife returned alone to New Hampshire, where she suffered long bouts of depression, made worse by the death of her firstborn child. Fighting liquor and religious doubt, and devastated by the loss of his son, in 1840, Pierce finally renounced alcohol. It is a body-destroying, heartbreaking, dangerous habit. I will no longer take a drop of any kind of stimulant. A year and a half later, he quit the Senate and returned to New Hampshire to try to rebuild his family life. There, his second son would also die, leaving behind only the youngest. Over the years, Jane would utterly dedicate her life to Benny, the surviving child. When I resigned my seat in the Senate in 1842, I did it with the fixed purpose never again to be voluntarily separated from my family, except at the call of my country in time of war. That call came in 1846 when his country went to war with Mexico. It was not long before Brigadier General Pierce found himself leading 2,500 men south of the border in search of the glory he had never achieved in politics. But it eluded him again. My horse fell under me upon a ledge of rocks by which I sustained a severe sprain in my left knee. I became exceedingly faint. His commanding officer, General Winfield Scott, labeled him a coward and ordered him to leave the field. And though New Hampshire welcomed him home a war hero, Pierce was haunted by what he knew was a disappointing record. I hate war in all its aspects. I deem it unworthy of the age in which I live. Franklin Pierce had been retired from politics for more than a decade and was virtually unknown when the 1852 Democratic Convention took place in Baltimore. Battling for the nomination were the leading men of the party, Lewis Cass, James Buchanan, William Marcy, Sam Houston, and Stephen A. Douglas. But it was soon clear that none could win the race for the required two-thirds vote. What was needed was a compromised candidate to rally behind. And on the 36th ballot, when General Franklin Pierce's name was first suggested, there was surprisingly little opposition. Pierce was so obscure in national politics that he had no known enemies. That was his great virtue. Oh, he'd been a perfectly good congressman. He was a very successful lawyer in New Hampshire. But... He, he was a man of no particular distinction. He was a northerner who sympathized with the southerners. Pierce's open support of southern interests made him acceptable to the south. 
and on the 49th ballot, he won the nomination. His opponent in the national election was none other than his old military commander, Winfield Scott. During the campaign, Scott mocked Pierce's war record, and he was ridiculed by reports of his former drinking. But with the support of all the slave states, Franklin Pierce went on to win the election in November. The New York Tribune lamented, we have fallen on great times for little men. Just two months before his inauguration, the president-elect was traveling by train with his wife and their 11-year-old son, Benny, when tragedy struck. There was a train wreck, and while the president-elect and Mrs. Pierce were merely shaken up, their son was crushed to death right in front of their eyes. The, the shot uh, was something that Mrs. Pierce is said never to have got over, and Pierce had to face the presidency fresh from this family tragedy, pretty much on his own and pretty much without any kind of personal support. I presume you have heard of the terrible catastrophe upon the railroad, which took from me my only child. How I shall be able to summon my manhood and gather up my energies for the duties before me is hard for me to see. The most serious duty looming over the new president concerned the nation's struggle over the future of slavery. Choosing as his Secretary of War, Mississippi's Jefferson Davis, Pierce unequivocally sided with the South. Involuntary servitude is recognized by the Constitution and stands like any other admitted right. Ignoring how unpopular it was in the North, Pierce enforced the Fugitive Slave Act. It led to rioting in Boston and widespread anti-Pierce protests. Then he imprudently backed the controversial Kansas-Nebraska Act, which permitted new Western territories, even those long assumed to be slave-free, to decide for themselves if slavery should spread there. It was the chief domestic action of Pierce's administration, and it alienated him throughout the North. Pierce saw the problem of keeping the country together. He saw it as a problem of conciliating the South. I think this was a fundamental miscalculation. The South did not need conciliation. The South needed to come to grips with the fact that if a, if a war was precipitated between North and South, the North was getting irritated enough to fight it and strong enough to win it. In May 1856, war over slavery broke out in Kansas. Unable to unite the Democratic Party or offer positive leadership to his tormented country, Pierce was passed over for a second term when his party turned instead to James Buchanan. In March 1857, Franklin Pierce returned home to New Hampshire, having helped the nation along the road to civil war. Four years later, as Southern states were seceding from the Union, he revealed his support of them in a letter to Jefferson Davis, now the leader of Southern secession. If I were in the Southerners' places, I should probably be doing what they're doing. If our fathers were mistaken when they formed the Constitution, then the sooner we are apart, the better. When this letter was intercepted and published in the newspapers, it destroyed the last of Pierce's remaining credibility. Reviled as a traitor, despised even in his own state, an embittered Franklin Pierce became increasingly reclusive. When his wife Jane died in 1863, he lost his last remaining reason to live. For 20 years, he had stayed away from alcohol. Now, once again, he gave in to his appetite for liquor. 
After the White House, what is there to do but drink? And that's exactly what the dark horse from New Hampshire did. He drank himself right into the grave. Thank you.